مساء الخير جميعا جود افترنون ماي توك توداي از اباوت ليسنز ليرند فروم ذا كاسل اي اف اند ذا كابانا ستاديز اند ايل ستارت اوف وذ ا كويك انتروداكشن اوف سام ستاف ذات وي اوريدي نو سو اي اف از اوف كورس ون اوف ذا ميجر كوزز اوف ستروك هارت فيلير اند كارديو فاسكولار موربيتيز اول اوفر ذا وورلد اند اتس اندبندنتلي اسوسييتد with two-fold increase of all-cause mortality in women and 1.5-fold increase in the same thing in men. So the main lines of therapy would be AF prevention, stroke prevention, rhythm control, rate control, and AF surgeries. These are our tools to handle this complex uh, arrhythmia. Um, it ha always has been uh, considered a, a complex uh, uh, disease with a complex mechanism that is uh, multifactorial and variable from one uh, patient to the other. But uh, two main mechanisms has been uh, uh, co taking considerable attention, uh, namely uh, triggers, whether it pulmonary, be pulmonary vein triggers or non-pulmonary vein triggers, and mechanisms that perpetuate atrial fibrillation. So this is the seminal observation that was uh, uh, observed by Hesager and colleagues, uh, pointing to the fact that ectopic um, from the pulmonary veins is uh, associated with the development of atrial fibrillation in the majority of patients. Uh, as we uh, went along, um, beside the pulmonary veins, there has been non-pulmonary vein triggers that include the left atrial appendage, the coronary sinus, and the superior vena cava in some patients. Um, so triggers aside, mechanisms that perpetuate the atrial fibrillation is uh, either electric remodeling that involve a process of inflammation and oxidative stresses that leads to altered calcium handling and eventually cause perpetuation of atrial fibrillation. On the other hand, structural remodeling that involves atrial stretch and atrial fibrosis together with the development of left ventricular dysfunction are all factors that are mechanical and lead to the concept of atrial fibrillation begetting atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is an important slide uh, that I have uh, came across. Uh, it reviews the literature on several axes of management of atrial fibrillation. So uh, first, the green axis is the axis of prevention atrial fibrillation that reached the step of the RACE 3 study, uh, which is a study denoting that uh, risk factor modification that includes physical activity and weight reduction together with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and statins could be very beneficial in prevention of recurrence of persistent atrial fibrillation. The blue axis would be dealing with anticoagulation. We started off by the fact that warfarin is superior to aspirin, and then uh, we came across uh, NOAX, and there be the fact that they are non-inferior uh, to warfarin in the prevention of thromboembolic complications, and we reach it the stage where NOAX are now peripheral than warfarin in the prevention of uh, thromboembolic complications. Um, an important axis of note is this purple axis over here that deals with the prevention of atrial fibrillation interventionally, namely pulmonary vein isolation. We came across uh, pulmonary veins being superior than antiarrhythmic drugs, and then uh, in the STAR AF2 study, we noted the fact that PVI alone could be enough without doing cafes or extra lines and so forth. And till we reach the step of cryoablation that is almost as effective as pulmonary vein, uh, as uh, radio frequency energy in achieving uh, pulmonary vein isolation and thus prevention of atrial fibrillation. So in view of this cumulative evidence, where are we in terms of intervention for atrial fibrillation? Catheter ablation now is indicated for symptomatic atrial fibrillation uh, that failed uh, at least one antiarrhythmic drug, and that would be class one indication. And it could be a matter of fact, a substitute for uh, antiarrhythmic drugs in those patients who does not prefer being on antiarrhythmic drugs lifelong. And now I'm gonna go through this case scenario of Mr. R.S., who is a 65-year-old gentleman who has ischemic cardiomyopathy, an ejection fraction of 35%, his left atrium 
is 50 millimeter in its widest diameter. He has an ICD for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death. He developed long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation that is difficult to rate control and caused inappropriate shocks twice. The question is what would be the next best step in his management based on the available body of evidence? Would, do we go for AFib ablation or do we do AV node ablation and upgrade to a CRT or we just up titrate the medications to the maximum tolerated dose and consider amiodarone for recontrol? In a matter of fact, this was exactly the question that was uh, addressed in the Kessel AF study, so catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation in patients with heart failure. So the Kessel uh, AF study enrolled and randomized about 400 patients um, in a one-to-one -one fashion uh, after they screened about 3,000 patients for the eligibility criteria. Um, patients were randomized into two arms, conventional medical therapy and ablation procedure for patients with heart failure who have an implantable device. All those patients had symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. They had an ejection fraction that is less to or equal 35%. Uh, um, they had an NYHA class more than two, and they had an implantable device with home monitoring to allow rigorous follow-up of the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. They were followed along for about 60, 60 months or so, and the primary endpoint was the all-cause mortality and worsening of heart failure. Their baseline characteristics, uh, they had an age, uh, mean, median age of about 64 years. Um, they were 60% non-ischemics in the ablation arm and about 52% um, ischemics in the medical treatment arm. They had the majority of patients had persistent rather than paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Again, another look at the pertinent um, uh, data in terms of the baseline data. Uh, the left atrial diameter had a median uh, of 48 millimeters and the ejection fraction was in the range of about 32 or so. So these patients were followed along and this is um, uh, looking at the probability of survival free of hospital uh, admission um, in terms of the primary endpoint, which was death or worsening of heart failure. And we can clearly see here that um, the ablation arm did better with a hazard ratio of 0.26 and, um, and a, a confidence interval that is not crossing the moiety with a statistically significant p-value. When, uh, when looking at secondary endpoint, which uh, included uh, either worsening of the heart failure alone or death from any cause, the ablation arm retained its superiority over the arm um, where the medical treatment was uh, the, uh, the therapy uh, given. So that means that catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation in patients with heart failure was associated with significantly lower rates of the composite endpoint of death from any cause or hospitalization for worsening of heart failure. And that would be one of the important studies because of the fact that it showed mortality benefit for ablation of atrial fibrillation in this particular uh, group of patients, patients with heart failure. So now we go to another scenario. This is Mr. A.H., who is a 53-year-old gentleman who has a structurally normal heart and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that has been recurrent on Sotalol. He came to your care for counseling regarding AFib ablation procedure. He had a particular inquiry regarding the incremental value of the procedure in terms of stroke reduction and life expectancy over standard medical treatment. What would be your next best response based on the available body of evidence? The procedure would offer prolongation of survival. The procedure prevents strokes. The procedures prevent AFib recurrences and thus reduces symptoms. Again, this was the question that was addressed in the Cabana study, which was unfortunately for most electrophysiologists disappointing. Catheter ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs uh, for treatment of atrial fibrillation. 
So in this study, about 2,000 patients or more who had symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion to ablation versus medical treatment. Their mean age uh, was about 65 or so, and the primary endpoint was the composite endpoint of death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, and cardiac arrest. In a matter of fact, when the study started back in 09, um, the primary endpoint was all cause mortality. But because of the fact that the event rate was limited in 2013, they had to change the composite uh, the endpoint to this composite endpoint to be able to reach the primary endpoint. Uh, in this study, um, about 1,000 patients were randomized to ablation therapy, and the other 1,000 were randomized to drug therapy. It's very important to note that the crossover from the drug therapy limb to the ablation therapy limb was quite considerable. So about a third of patients were crossed over from the drug therapy group to the ablation group. Baseline uh, characteristics of both patients' group were comparable as what would be expected from the randomization process. When they looked at the result of the primary endpoint, which was the composite endpoint that we've just mentioned, over a period of about 60 months, there was no statistically significant difference between the drug therapy arm and the catheter ablation arm. So catheter ablation did not show incremental value in terms of stroke prevention and mortality benefit more than the well-known value that we know of prevention of AF recurrences and decreasing symptoms. When, when they looked at the secondary endpoint, which were about 13 secondary endpoints, the most important of which was all-cause mortality and mortality or cardiovascular hospitalization, again, there was no difference between the drug therapy arm and the catheter ablation arm in both analyses. It's very important to note that this was an intention to treat analysis, which is the more rigorous analysis that is um, benefit that benefits from the fact that we that this is a, a randomized trial that eliminates the selection bias. On the other hand, when when the analysis was made in terms of the actual lines of treatment that the patients at the end were assigned to, there was a benefit in terms of the primary endpoint. But again, this analysis is a secondary analysis that takes away the value of randomization, namely elimination of selection bias. The only beneficial value that was uh, um, uh, rigorous and, uh, and valid in the Cabana study in the intention to treat analysis was the reduction in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation uh, and the burden of atrial fibrillation in the catheter ablation arm. So this is a survival analysis again over 48 months with a statistically significant hazard ratio of 0.52 and a p-value that is less than 0.05. This is uh, looking at the AF burden over the months in the whole term monitor that was done for the patient serially. And as you can see, the blue bars stands for the drug arm and the ablation uh, bar, uh, the, uh, the orange bars stands for the ablation arm. And it was consistently lower on follow-up more than six months and beyond that the AF episodes were higher in the drug therapy arm. So to conclude, among patients with atrial fibrillation, the strategy of catheter ablation compared with medical treatment did not significantly reduce the primary composite endpoint of death, disabling stroke, bleeding, or cardiac arrest. The estimated treatment effect of catheter ablation was affected, number one, by the lower rate of expected events, which eventually led to changing the the primary endpoint and the fact that there was a significant amount of crossover from the medical treatment arm to the ablation arm. 
So to wrap up the lessons learned from the Castle AF and the Cabana study, patients with atrial fibrillation and AF benefit the most from catheter ablation regarding reducing mortality, which is a very solid endpoint that we could not reach up till now in the general population of AF patients, hospitalization, of course, AF burden. The Cabana did not really change how we think. The dogma has always been that atrial fibrillation target symptoms and AF recurrences, and there has, no, uh, been, there has not been any uh, proven of survival benefit. Uh, Cabana failed to show an incremental survival benefit over the already known benefits of atrial fibrillation ablation. Cabana confirmed that AF ablation can be done with a low rate of complications. The improvement in the quality of life is significantly greater in patients who are undergoing uh, catheter ablation when they are compared to those who are on medical treatment. Ablation was significantly more effective than the drug arm for <coughs> decreasing AF recurrences regardless the type of atrial fibrillation. And with that we stop. Thank you so much.